Poppy has to be able to see the questions for the, those who are typing in questions. The last session, we only had two questions that got added by the audience. The first session, I think there were about, uh, I don't know, 10. Okay, Gary, we are live, just one second. <clears throat> we are live. Welcome to session three, new tools for practitioners at the Farm Foundation Farm Credit Conference on Beginning Farmers and Ranchers. Uh, the purpose of this panel is to provide a quick list of uh, favorite training resources and a compendia by the panelists of how they use them. Um, but before we get to introducing the moderator um, and the panelists, I'd ask to you to uh, turn your attention to the poll question that's gonna appear on your screen. It's a multiple choice poll. And the question is, what subject is the hardest to teach beginning farmers? Um, so I'd uh, like you to consider answering that um, on, your, uh, uh, on your screens. And now I'll move on to describing Hopefully what this, what this, uh, this panel brings to you. Um, we have in our panelists uh, several who actually do specific training with beginning farmers and they use, they use very different tools. Um, and what we'd like to do is, is buy you with not just a really long list of uh, go here, go there. Well, that'll be part of this presentation. At the end of the presentation, you'll see some resources specifically but along the way, this panel is going to discuss uh, the tools that they do use and why they use them and how they use them. And to lead us through that is uh, going to be Poppy Davis. Um, she's a uh, business and policy advisor to agricultural and food and beverage enterprises, and also to nonprofits and local governments. She holds a JD from Drake University Law School, a master's in journalism from Georgetown, and a BS in ag economics from UC Davis. Um, the, the, the short way to say, uh, uh, to describe Poppy is, she is everywhere you wanna be because she is so involved with uh, beginning farmer education and has been part of USDA. She's been a teaching staff. She's been in charge of nonprofits. She is everywhere that you want to be. So Poppy, with that glowing introduction, could you please introduce <laughs> panelist to us and take us through this next session. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this um, and having this panel. And um, thanks for going way over the 50 word bio that I gave you. Um, welcome everyone. I'm excited to be on this panel. First time doing a presentation like this and this kind of a virtual conference probably for all of us. So um, I'm glad for the learning opportunity to figure out this new technology and the new way of being together. Um, so this session, like Gary said, it's about how to find the tools and resources created by other organizations and integrate those into your own programming. Um, one of the key points we're going to make over and over again is um, just because you take a tool from somewhere else doesn't mean it's going to be easy, right? There's still a lot of work to do around that. I'm going to start by introducing the panel, and then each of them are going to introduce their organizations and their work. And then after that, we'll have a panel discussion, and um, we we'll hope to have at least 15 minutes at the end, maybe more, for audience discussion and question and answer. So feel free to post your questions in the chat as you go, and then when we get to the end, we'll have as much time as possible for that Q&A. Um, so this panel, I'd like to start by introducing Julia Freegood, who's the Senior Advisor at American Farmland Trust, and there she leads the farming, uh, Farms for a New Generation initiative to help beginning farmers and ranchers access and secure land. The program includes projects to train the trainers, to create curriculum and resources, and to build service provider networks. The other panelist is Mike Strand, who's the Vice President of Advocacy for the National Farmers Union. He has been in this role since um, early in this year, and he works to advance and expand National Farmer Union outreach to policymakers 
partners and the general public through communications and government relation efforts. I think he's pinch hitting for um, the people who usually lead the beginning farmer training program at the NFU, but he is involved in those programs and knowledgeable about them. Um, and then we have Karen McGrath, who I work very closely with almost daily. She's the program manager at California FarmLink, and she oversees the English language education and technical assistance programs there related to land tenure and agricultural financing. Carrie is originally from Minnesota, and she has a degree in agricology and ethnobotany from the University of California at Santa Cruz. Um, so, Morgan, we're going to go to the first intro slide now. And Julia, um, go ahead and give an overview, please, of your organization and the training tools and the programs broadly um, before we get into more specific questions. Sure. Thanks, Poppy. Um, um, it's really it's an honor to be here with everybody um, and especially to serve on this panel with such great leaders in the field. Uh, you'll hear me say later, but I use everybody's resources a lot who's here, so it's a really nice opportunity for me. Uh, to tell you a little bit about American Farmland Trust, we're a nonprofit agricultural conservation organization, and our mission is to save the land that sustains us by protecting farmland, promoting sound farming practices, and keeping farmers on the land. We believe that farming is our future and that we can't hope for thriving communities or a sustainable society without successful farms that are themselves sustainable in all senses of that word. And we do this in, in many ways, um, including research and education, and I'll be focusing on the education, part of that education anyway today. Uh, we do direct land protection. We are a land trust, um, but we also do advocacy, planning, and public development policy development and demonstration projects. Uh, we're headquartered in Washington, DC, but we have regional offices across the country. I'm part of the national team, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm based in Northampton or usually based in Northampton, Massachusetts when it isn't a pandemic. And um, we have three other national divisions here in this office, as well as the New England regional office. And then in terms of Farms for a New Generation, that's our, relatively new, a couple of year old national initiative to ensure the health and prosperity of people and planet by preparing a diverse new generation of farmers and ranchers to gain access to land, steward it well, and succeed in agriculture. It's all part of AFT's effort to get farming right, which we talk about a lot, before it's too late and because it's necessary for future food security, environmental quality, and climate resiliency. And we leverage all of AFT's program areas to support this new generation broadly defined from research to advocacy. Today, I'm gonna to be focusing a lot on our land access training program and especially on a curriculum that we developed um, both to train trainers, but also to help a new generation of farmers and ranchers secure land. And I will leave it there. Thank you, Julia. Mike, do you wanna give a presentation? And Morgan, you can advance the slide. Sounds good. Thank you, Poppy, and thank you all for the opportunity to join you today to talk about what National Farmers Union is doing uh, to help educate beginning farmers and ranchers. A little bit about National Farmers Union before uh, we go further. Uh, NFU is a general farm organization with about 200,000 members across the country. We have organized divisions in 33 states, but members in all 50. Uh, we envision a world in which family farmers and their families and their communities are respected, valued, and enjoy economic prosperity and social justice. As far as a mission, uh, it's probably best summed up by the triangle you see on the slide there, uh, with education at the base and cooperation and legislation on the sides. Uh, we'll talk most. I'll talk mostly about our education efforts later on in this presentation. But uh, the bulk of our work, a lot of our work, has to do with helping farmers find better education, find better policies, and find power through cooperatives to uh, establish a better way of life. Our national headquarters is in Washington, DC, uh, but the bulk of our farmers union activities are carried out by our state divisions. NFU generally serves as a clearinghouse of information, as a way to organize across state lines, but also to uh, help uh, 
facilitate good work by our states and to empower them to uh, uh, spread our message and to spread the information that Farmers Union is so happy to provide. Uh, and as such, we're a grassroots organization. So we work on a wide variety of issues across topics and methods of production, farm types, scales, uh, we've got it all. So on cooperation, uh, Farmers Union has a history of setting up cooperatives so that farmers can find greater market power. Uh, historically, that's been about earning better prices for crops, having affordable options for purchasing inputs, transportation, Many of the farm co-ops that we know and enjoy across uh, much of the country that were set up more than half a century ago uh, have farmers union connections. That spirit continues today with a lot of our efforts on cooperative development in kind of a new spirit and a new era. The other side of the triangle on legislation, obviously we spent a lot of 2020 talking about the pandemic and trying to find better policies for farmers to respond to the new realities that the pandemic has brought on agriculture. With big shifts in supply and demand, uh, policy has had a tough time keeping up. So our uh, staff has been working on that. Further, uh, we also are a lot very concerned about concentration in the marketplace for agriculture, uh, the stresses that have been put on rural health systems, uh, our need for rural connectivity. Hopefully my broadband will hold up here and also look ahead to 2020 to work on climate change. However, uh, again, it's about education today, uh, and I'll talk about how Farmers Union uses our Farm Business Toolbox, which is modeled after the Business Health Assessment Tool, and we use it in a few of our programs, namely the Beginning Farmer Institute and Women's Conference, uh, which we'll talk more about. So I'll turn it back to Poppy, and thanks again for being here. Thanks, Mike. Morgan, could you please advance the slide and Carrie, you're up. Thanks, Poppy. Uh oh. You look good and sound good to me. Okay, great. I just can't see myself, but I get to look right at you. That's even better. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm with California Farm Link, and uh, we provide land access and tenure which we do through a land portal system that's user generated. And then we have worked with the Stanford Law Group to design a really great template for land tenure through a lease process. And then we, of course, also um, really focus on capital. We're a CDFI, so we're a community development financial institution. And we work pre preliminary with a lot of underserved folks and focus on providing access to capital and land tenure. And then I am the resilience program manager. So I'm focusing on the business skills for English speaking farmers and ranchers. Can we go to the next slide, please? So we for today, I'm going to be focusing on our educational programming and really focusing on the Resilerator, also known as the business resilience intensive, which is when we're talking about tools, we utilized Poppy's curriculum for that. That was our tool. And we go into, you know, deeping dive into insurance, employees, bookkeeping, QuickBooks, all of that good stuff. And then from that, we came out that we really needed to do some QuickBooks um, clinics where they're getting one-on-one -on -one, uh, time and with a bookkeeper, for, so face-to-face. And then we, from that also was that we have this amazing curriculum that Poppy developed, but it was really overwhelming for a lot of folks because it was so much information. So then we went into looking at breaking off some of those sections. So she does an ins insurance um, portion, but then bringing in an insurance person to really come in and do these you know, great Q and A's with folks. We have a farm finance expo, which of course this year went virtual. So it's the farm finance forum. Um, we've done that for many years. I think this was our fifth or sixth one. And then we also have wealth building, which is the Spanish language portion that I'm going to actually let Poppy speak on. Yeah, so the Spanish language program, we can talk about it a little bit more in the rest of the conversation, but um, we're in the process of building that program out. We tried as much as possible not to simply translate an English language program into Spanish. We started with a name in Spanish and, and uh, really designing the whole program in Spanish for Spanish speakers from their culture and their cultural perspective. A lot of the technical information ended up being translated directly, but not until after we'd done a lot of soul searching about which parts 
were translated and which parts were um, left out or which parts were highlighted or not highlighted. So that's the Spanish language program. It ends up being very similar to the English language program, but quite distinct in its own, in several important ways that are culturally um, significant to the, to the users of the program. Yeah, we can definitely I guess talk. I'll talk about succession too, Carrie, because um, okay. I'm working, that, that is also in development and that's gonna be a cohort based program. It relates back to the core curriculum, but it moves the core curriculum forward into the transition moment. And it requires the re it will require the retiring farmer to bring their identified successor with them to the program. So it's not just for the exiting farmer, it's very much also for the entering farmer. Thanks, Carrie. So before we get into the panel questions, um, Gary has asked me to go over the results of the, um, the little survey that you did about what were the hardest subjects to teach beginning farmers. And 44% uh, said business planning generally. Um, so we're actually gonna talk a little bit more in this session, kind of put some definition about what does that mean? What, what do we mean by business planning? Because it's a very general term. 28% um, said financial record keeping, and we're gonna talk a lot more about that as well, because that's also used as a general term and then in more specific ways. 16% um, said human resources management. We're not gonna talk about that in this session. 8% um, said how to spend their crop profits, which is a really important question. Um, keys to scaling up and certainly keys to future wealth development. Um, and then 4% said crop production and growing, which is definitely not what we're gonna talk about in this section. Um, all right, so to kind of cue this up, the framing here is tools, right? And how to use tools or integrate tools into your program. So I'm gonna start with you, Mike, um, but I'm gonna ask you all the same question. What is a tool for your practice of farmer education? What's an example of something you use that was created outside of your organization that you bring into your organization and deploy into your programs? Um, what is it and how do you use it in your programs? Can you go ahead, Mike? Sure, Poppy, and thanks for that question. It's really good to be part of the whole ecosystem of tools that are available uh, and that there are lots of uh, new ways to reuse some of the resources that are out there to best shape uh, or to be shaped and fit within uh, your own organization's work. So in this case, it's not simply a tool that we have, but kind of a toolbox. Uh, and using any of the other uh, efforts that people have used to create a few different tools individually. So in 2019, we launched our NFU's Farm Business Toolbox. Uh, and like I noted, it's modeled after the business health assessment. Uh, it's on our website, nfu.org slash toolbox. And the goal of the toolbox is to help farmers identify their own operations, strengths and weaknesses and then uh, offer some opportunities to improve their business knowledge. Uh, and these resources are all grouped together into topic areas listed in the uh, business health assessment. Farmers Union members and other users or anyone who comes upon this are encouraged to complete the VHA and use their scores to prioritize the resources within the toolbox. So if, for example, uh, if you do particularly well in the land section, you might skip over that section of the toolbox and go straight away into accounting or something like that. So it's a good way to triage, I guess. Uh, and then this, this fall, uh, we updated the toolbox to include seven new videos uh, where our moderator extraordinaire, Poppy Davis, focuses on some of the most important elements of the business health assessment. And so for next year, we're gonna build on that and host some office hours with users or other interested parties to connect with Poppy and ask questions that crop up because of those videos. So we've been working on this model with some of our existing programs and so far it's been a great result. So it's been a good way to cross pollinate uh, within the farmers union programs with work that others have done. Uh, and you know, if we're all on the same page and advancing towards the same goal. I think it works well to, to do that. So I. I hope that answers your question, Bobby. It does. And I'm going to go ahead and just make a little comment here, Mike, about the history of the National Farmers Union Beginning Farmer Institute and also how that relates to the development of the business health assessment. 
So I've been very fortunate, and I've met with every cohort of the Beginning Farmer Institute since Maria Miller started the program quite some years ago now. I forget even how many cohorts we're in, right? So for several years, I met with a cohort rather informally, and we would just go around the table and, um, you know, do some just question and answer and conversation about the nuts and bolts of um, what each of the participants was dealing with in their operation, either starting an operation or taking over a family operation. Those are the two most typical kinds of participants. And a lot of the themes that came out of those conversations are reflected in the self-assessment questions of the business health assessment. And one of the things that kept coming up more and more was that um, we, we, as I started to get a handle on how to organize the questions and the themes and the topics, that led to um, the ability to develop a curriculum that would address those questions and themes in a coherent way that builds on learning rather than um, the Q&A we were doing, which was sort of staccato and just responding to whatever was asked without necessarily having the strategy of building um, layers and layers of knowledge. Um, Carrie, do you want to go next with a quick description of uh, tools and how you use them in the FarmLink programs? So we also use the business health assessment um, and that's been really helpful for us to gauge. So basically with the business, um, what we just talked about with the business health assessment, we do with the Resolerator before that cohort starts, they have to fill it out and we're looking and then Poppy reviews it. Uh, and then we're now gonna be looking at doing the follow-up so doing re-scores of the business health assessment for the folks that took that, that cohort from three years ago. And we're gonna be continuing doing that going forward. So that's one really you know, significant tool that multiple organizations are using. We also are using Poppy's curriculum for the business resilience intensive or, the res or also known as the Resolerator. Um, and that's been really helpful as well because it wasn't starting from scratch. It was already utilizing something that was there but I guess I want to really make clear that it wasn't like a plug and play, like, oh, Poppy's here. We'll just, she'll just do this whole, all this curriculum and it will be great. It, from, we learned a lot of great lessons of just like how much information, how much the farmers and ranchers were really absorbing and what were some areas that we really needed to work on more and focus on. Thanks, Carrie. Um, Julia, you're mainly queued up for developing tools, but do you want to talk for a couple minutes about tools from others that you use and integrate? Yeah, that's that's what I plan to do. And and it was a little hard um, listening to Mike. I think what we really need is a toolbox <laughs> because I couldn't choose just one. Um, but our, our curriculum that I'll be talking about later is very skills based and and we try to incorporate as many existing resources that are helpful as possible. And so I'll just sort of list off a few of the main ones. Um, and I'll start because people, because the poll said that business planning generally was one of those hard things to teach. Um, one of the things that we've used a lot is something that was developed by Farm Credit and it's a cash flow budget. And it's really pretty straightforward and easy to use. And, and we use it to help beginners figure out really what, what they can afford, whether it's in a leasing arrangement or in a purchase arrangement. Um, and so that's sort of incorporated early into our curriculum. But another tool, and because Gary's on, on this call or on this Zoom, uh, I, I thought I wanted to, to mention was something he developed years and years ago, and it was called, Is Your Town Farm Friendly? And we have kind of adapted it to use it across the country. He, he developed it for New Hampshire. We use it now all across the country and have adapted it to help beginners figure out whether if they've identified a location where they want to farm, whether it actually has the zoning in place and ordinances in place and maybe a farmer's market or other infrastructure in place that's going to support their operation so that it, it helps them sort of think through not just what the land and the property is going to be good for them, but also whether there's a supportive community. Um, some other tools that I think are really important if you're trying to train in land access um, is the National Young Farmers um, created this Finding Farmland Calculator, which is kind of a unique mortgage calculator that teaches farmers about financing options, their credit worthiness, 
um, that kind of stuff that they need to know when buying farmland. And, and so we also incorporate that when we talk about purchasing land. Um, and it gives them lots of scenarios that they can use to figure things out. And then we use lots of directories like the Web Soil Survey or USDA Service Directory. Um, and we've created some directories as well that people can use just to help people quickly get to resources that they need, even if they don't have a person in the room, which I think is probably especially helpful, you know, in a pandemic situation where people are so reliant on the internet. I will leave it there. Um, I, I, I could keep okay. listing them, but I, I was really only supposed to choose one, so. Okay, good. Um, Carrie, do you wanna talk about tools you've built at FarmLink? Sure. I'm wondering if like, are you talking about resilience to wealth building tool? No more, no more like the plug and play things, things that you've built at, at FarmLink that have become tools at this point, like plug and play. Okay, um, so our Farm Finance Expo is a really great example of our plug and play. It's just like, it's, it's you know, super basic, right? You're just getting a bunch of different lenders in the room that actually understand agriculture to talk to potential clients. And so, and giving, you know, various financing, options but then also like the reality of is this farmer or rancher ready to take on debt what would that look like and so we have been doing that we know which banks we're going to be working with which cdfis um, you know we are a lender but we're not necessarily going to say that you should only be looking at us right we always are saying like you should shop around if you qualify for fsa that's amazing you should be going with fsa those kinds of things. So that's, and that's, we took it virtual this year. I mean, I think that's like what we're all struggling with, right? Is now how we're gonna change these tools to work virtually because every farmer and rancher I talk to is just like, can we still go back to doing this small cohort if it's under 10 people in person, which of course I'm in the state of California and we're definitely not gonna be doing that anytime soon. Thank you. Um... Mike, do you want to talk a little bit more maybe about how you've, um, if there's any tools you've built or um, you might, those might be examples of some of your co-op education tools. Yeah, I mean, some of the co-op education tools, uh, I guess, fall, fall a bit outside of our uh, work with the business health assessment, but uh, you know, we've got curriculum put together on a variety of agricultural and cooperative background topics that can be used. Uh, actually saw some use, uh, particularly during this spring when there was more uh, homeschool sort of uh, virtual learning opportunities that we were able to pull in. Uh, some of those resources that we've had uh, tucked away for a time perhaps uh, got a little more attention when people were looking for additional activities like that. So that falls outside the BHA and uh, kind of the beginning farmer sphere but those sorts of topics, whether it's for youth education on co-ops or adult education on co-ops and pure culture broadly, uh, saw a real uptick earlier in 2020. And hopefully we can keep that uh, interest there in coming years too. That's great. And I just want to make a little comment about the co-ops. It's interesting when I work with beginning farmers, there's always someone in the room who comes into the room convinced they're going to start a co-op, which means they don't understand what co-ops are, right? Um, you know, they, they have a general sense that co-ops are good and farm friendly and those things, but they don't actually understand that the farm itself is not the co-op, right? So you say that the co-op education isn't directly related to beginning farmer education, but it's interesting, you know, where, the, where their curiosity is and where their preconceived ideas are and so they do need some way to access that information and understand how it does or doesn't fit with what they're really going to do. Yeah. That's, Julia, that's do you want to talk about, um, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mike. There was a lag there. Sorry, I was going to just uh, kind of point out that it's uh, important to find ways to redirect that enthusiasm too. You know, you don't want to direct people away from co-ops, but also just make sure they, that those who are interested understand what it's about and that maybe it's more of a beginning farm uh, topic more so than co-op development. So you always hate to <laughs> uh, have to redirect that sort of enthusiasm, but it's important. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. And having the tools available makes it a lot easier, right? So you're not just stuck in a one-on-one -on -one loop of a conversation, but you actually can point them to where they can fully satisfy their curiosity about that topic. Um, Julia, do you want to go ahead and talk about the tools that you've built? Sure, yeah. Um, so this time I am going to sort of roll them all up and, and talk about our land assets curriculum as a tool itself. Um, and it's designed to support ag educators and service providers, including us at AFT, train and mentor uh, you know, young beginning and historically underserved producers as they search for a secure land tenure situation. We created it and you know, Poppy was one of our advisors and, and everybody here basically helped us create this thing. Um, and and it, it's a bit of an octopus. It's pretty comprehensive. It has eight units that are meant to be adapted to specific beginning farmer audiences. It takes a skills-based approach, um, focusing really on what, what the producers need to be able to do, um, as well as what they need to know, but not, not really primarily focusing on kind of lectures and lots and lots of presentation content, but more interactive things that they can do either alone or with each other or with a mentor to figure things out on their own. Um, it starts with goal setting and financial readiness, and then addresses the three paths to land access, leasing, purchasing, and receiving land through inheritance or gift, um, and covers related topics like finding land and site assessment, where we do actually incorporate a lot of tools. Um, so far it's been used with well over a thousand young beginning, you know, and underserved producers in 30 states, um, representing all kinds of folks from you know, conventional dairy producers in the Midwest um, to new Americans starting out in urban agriculture. It was funded by a 2015 BFRDP grant, um, has had fairly wide circulation in the last couple of years. And so far we've trained about 250 folks, um, certified 22 to use it. And we use the tools that I mentioned before, um, but we also have developed a whole lot of worksheets and self-assessment tools and evaluation tools um, to help beginners you know, assess properties, guide them through their own decision-making, whether it's setting their own goals or figuring out their financial readiness or identifying a location where they wanna farm and finding land in that location, assessing land in that location um, so that they can you know, either start or expand their operations. And then, sort of beyond our curriculum, but through, we have a farmland information center and there we've developed some tools that are helpful as well, including searchable listings of all the farm link programs in the country, a protected farmland directory um, and things like that. So it's kind of, maybe that's our toolbox, but I, I'm thinking that we probably need something that we call a toolbox. So that I have a great idea that came out of this workshop. So thank you. Well, but it, you guys, you know, you're a large organization and you've been doing this a while. I would say that you have a tool shed. Much more of a shed than a box. Which is a good more thing. of a warehouse. <laughs> yeah, it might be more of a warehouse. Um, Carrie, since you're up, why don't you jump in here and talk about the challenges of taking a tool. Julia just described a whole bunch of tools. We've talked a little bit about the business health assessment and my curriculum that goes with it. Um, Carrie, this is your moment to tell the truth about the challenges of taking those tools and turning them into an actual program for actual people. Okay. So I was really naive I, when uh, Poppy approached me about this and I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like we have this curriculum already ready to go. Four weeks, we've got four sessions, four hours long and it's gonna be great. And I had all this interest and it was like, finally, you know, we were, everyone kept on, all the farmers and ranchers I was working with kept on saying the same thing to me, which is like, we need business skills. We need business skills. I don't really wanna learn how to do my accounting and my bookkeeping, but I should understand I can like look at my books and understand what that means. So when I implemented the resilerator, it was very apparent that I was wrong and there was a lot of work that needed to be done. And um, we did have tiers in the parking lot. I actually have to say more than once 
from, you know, farmers and ranchers that thought they were doing their books correctly. And it was very apparent when they were taking the accounting with Poppy and they're looking at the cash flow that they were not doing them correctly. And so from that, it was like, all right, we need to do deeper dives into our books. And so that came, you know, that's when I started doing these quick book clinics, more one-on-one -on -one TA assistance for folks to kind of handhold them through looking at their quick books and understanding what their books really mean. So that was really eye-opening. And then that's kind of like every, every section of Poppy's curriculum, you could do a much deeper dive on because what the feedback I got back was like, wow, that was really overwhelming for us. Like I literally went home and cried and I was like, well, I don't want anyone to cry. Like we really do want to try to figure out how to make this work. So that's kind of where we went. So now we went from four weeks to five weeks, got feedback that five weeks wasn't going to be enough. We looked at doing six weeks and for 2021, we're taking it virtual, but we're going to be doing it eight weeks. And so there's always the other thing that needed to happen. I wanted to make sure of is that there needs to be a farmer voice in the room for every week, right? So it's not just Poppy talking at them, that there's actually a farmer that's in their community or the rancher that can talk about their experience about looking at their cash flow, what that means. They onboarded their first employee, what that process was like, and then they tend to be a resource for them throughout the year, which has been very helpful as well. That's great. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and Mike, do you want to talk about what it's been like for you guys um, to actually like bringing these tools into your program and how the tools have modified your program? Sure thing. And how we've, uh, I guess, to keep the metaphor going, take the tools out of the shed and put them to work here. Uh, yeah. Like we've mentioned, uh, two of the NFU, or two of NFU's annual programs, education programs, use the BHA one kind of in a formal way and the other more informally. So uh, eight BHA uh, topics into two curriculum or into two different curricula and use those to select the sessions at our annual women's conference, which all again is coming up in over a month in January 17th to 18th. Um, so and it's a, it'll be in a virtual format this year, of course. Uh, but we'll be using some of those questions from the BHA to help us refine those sessions at the conference. And then, uh, you know, it works out as a way to uh, really dive in on topics that are of most interest to our participants and what we kind of expect to come up. So, for example, this year, uh, there'll be a lot on succession planning. And I mean, that's one of those questions in the final section of the BHA. Uh, and in a more formal way, uh, as Poppy noted, the other program that uses the, the tool is the Beginning Farmer Institute cohort, which has been going on for about 10 years now, I think. I think we're into our 10th or 11th cohort, uh, but it's comprised of new and beginning farmers from across the country. And each member of the cohort is uh, required to complete the BHA. And then we use those answers to coordinate with speakers like Poppy and others uh, on educational sessions. So earlier this year, we hosted a session on marketing with the with our beginning farmer institute and before the session each one of the presenters uh, using the the assessment and looking at the results had a clear understanding of how each member uh, marketed their product and where the gaps were uh, so it was a good way to uh, get a sense of what you were walking into as a presenter and to best uh, react to the needs of those uh, involved in the session so that, those are really the two big ways that we've been using it and keeping it active and available for our uh, toolbox on our website. Uh, get a model that others can easily use and you know, we're always happy to work with others on helping to fit your own organization's needs. Thank you. Um, Julia, before I have you answer this question from the perspective of what's it like to have your, to let your tool get integrated into someone else's program, I'll answer that question um, for myself as someone who developed this business health assessment and then developed a formal curriculum to support it. Um, and what it's been like for me deploying that tool um, into different programs around the country. So I work with um, the Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture in Northern Virginia, which is a veteran pro focused program, mostly focused on farmers that are not yet farming. But there's always a few people in the program who are already farming. Um, 
that program is a full year and my curriculum is spread out over the year and integrated with lots of other information. And they have a lot of support around each part of the unit and a lot of support on site in doing exercises around each unit. And for the most part, most of them aren't already farming. So it's advanced information. It's not quite as difficult because they don't have to integrate it that day. It's all sort of what's coming down the road for them. Um, and so related to the business health assessment, there is a tool called the business readiness assessment that is the same but different, same topics, but a little bit different verb tense in the questions that cues up whether or not people are prepared to start farming, whether or not really they've taken the right notes in the different sessions. In Oregon, I work with Ecotrust, and Ecotrust has built a two-year, uh, what they call Ag of the Middle Accelerator program. Um, that starts out with the core curriculum that I do with FarmLink that Carrie describes, it starts out delivering that curriculum in a pretty intensive way, but those farmers are quite advanced. They're definitely all advanced beginners who are already deep in it, and they're able to come to that information more as a reframing of what they're already doing. So not quite tears in the parking lot, but definitely for most of them, a big wake-up call that they finally see like where the pain points are, and then they're prepared. And then the whole rest of the program is about supporting them in moving forward and making changes to their systems based on what they learned in that first part of the program. Um, and then, like you heard from Carrie, we're sort of still figuring out our ideal model for how we're deploying this tool, actually deploying it into the FarmLink programming. Um, so Julie, you want to go and talk about your experiences having your tools deployed with other programs? Yeah, sure. Um, there are whole there there are several ways, I guess I would say. I think the first one and where where we really underestimated what it was going to take was um, we underestimated how hard it was to teach people to use tools <laughs> versus to just take our content on a PowerPoint and kind of stand up in front of a room and recite what was on the PowerPoint and. While we did develop content using PowerPoint slides to try to make it easy, we expected the trainers to adapt it and use it and modify it to reach their audience, not just, just kind of take it and just plop it up on a slide. And not only that, our, our curriculum, because it's skills-based, loses sort of all its meaning and relevance. If you just say, this is what land access is, this is what land tenure is, I mean, that's fine, but that's only a precursor to get people to figure out, you know, what they want, what they can afford, how to find it, how to make sure it's the right thing for them, and then how to negotiate the arrangement to get them onto that land. I, I don't really care if they know the philosophy behind it. Um, I, I really want to get that new generation onto suitable land to support the kind of operation they need so that they will succeed in agriculture. And so that I think came as sort of the first shock to us was just how hard it was to do the stuff that I thought was the fun, exciting and more creative part of our curriculum. Um, the other thing that's hard is we created something that's super comprehensive. I love content, you know, I mean, so maybe that's why everybody just focuses on the content, but it's really not the content. It's really the practice that makes our, our curriculum work. Um, but it's long. And so again, it's designed for people to use what they need, not it, we don't require everybody to use everything. You know, even people who are certified, they need to understand how to deliver it, but we also expect them to, to educate, right? To, to create and educate. And so figuring out how to take something that's basically 20 hours of learning, and then, you know, if you only have an hour with somebody or two hours with somebody, how do you then adapt it so that you pull the right information for that audience at the right time, given, you know, the location you're at and so on. And so, that's something that's been kind of creative, but I think a lot of people have, have done that well and better in some cases than really employing all the tools that we provide for people to use. Um, and I think the final one, and, and it, it picks up on something that Carrie, you said, which is what do we do in, in, you know, in an environment where everything has suddenly gone online and gone online before we were necessarily ready to go online? We already had some things that you could do kind of hybrid training with some online, but also in person. And because we want to build relationships 
between people and that idea, Mike, that you were talking about of a cohort of people. Um, that's been really challenging to do online, but we, we have had a couple of extension educators are actually who, he's, who have really found creative ways to figure out how to reduce the amount of content, um, use different tools to get people to engage with each other, even in an online setting. Um, you know, again, to sort of modify how much depth you go into, and then even to employ the tools and, and sort of teach people how to use the tools using an online setting. So that, I, I think we lose a lot, especially if you're trying to do something like site assessment, where it's really hard to do that if you can't go out and actually look at physical properties. Um, but we have now created a video to, to adapt to that problem that people can use. But I still think there's a lot to be said for in-person and for building a community amongst the beginners that we're training and that kind of thing. But to have this sort of hybrid approach maybe will, will be really good in the future. And especially, you know, I'm based in New England, so it's not hard to get places. I mean, they're not that far away, but if you're in, in the West where you have really, long, we have trainers in Montana and in you know, California and Colorado and places where you have to cover a lot of distance. And so I think figuring out how to adapt all this to the online environment will be a good and creative thing, but it's been challenging, certainly challenging this year to figure that out. So summary again, big picture concept that we said in the intro, um, don't think just because you found the right tool, it's going to be easy, right? If you have to dig a ditch and you have a brand new shovel, that's awesome that you have a brand new shovel but you have to dig the ditch and that's the hard work, right? So uh, maybe I shouldn't use a digging a ditch analogy for putting out programs, but um, you, have, you have all the lumber and the nails and the hammer and the tools to build a barn, right? It's still a lot of work to build the barn, even if you have all the right tools. And so, um, you know, big picture here, the message we wanna get across to people that are listening to this session and thinking about how to use tools in their programs is um, go ahead and save the time on the content that's been de developed for you because you're going to need all your time still. You're going to need a lot of time to figure out how to deploy that into your programs in the right way for you and your learners and your organization. So um, we're going to move to Q&A pretty soon, but we've got um, just a couple quick, quick go round questions. Um, so Morgan, we're gonna queue up the slides here again, and um, you can pull up Julia's slide. Um, this question is about when, when you are thinking about developing new program offerings or deploying things, how do you do your research on what's already out there and um, what, what do you, how do you decide you know, what the good resources are and what are your favorite resources? So, so some of our favorite resources are up on the slide, both our own um, and others that we often use. Um, and it, I call Poppy, I start with Poppy half the time. So <laughs> I'm only half kidding. Um, you know, Gary kind of said this, but Poppy really has her finger on the pulse of what's happening and, and pops up everywhere. So, so I often start with Poppy and, and with our other advisors um, who are represented on this panel, but we have more and they're across the country. Um, but but right now we're actually starting a new beginning farm and rancher development program grant and it's an educational enhancement grant. And so the first thing we're doing is trying to figure out what resources are out there that we can leverage and learn from. And um, it's on transitioning land to a new generation, both within farm families where there's a lot of literature and a lot of training already in place, but also between non-relatives where there really isn't much out there at all. And so um, we're starting with Farm Answers, which is supposed to have finished products from BFRDP projects and so on there um, in ERME and so on. Um, we in the past have gone and used the databases from BFRDP, ERME, RME, SARE, all those federal programs that fund things in our, in our kind of wheelhouse. Um, and then we really, really rely on tapping our advisors like Poppy um, to find out what they know, what they're using, what, what they've heard about is out there. And then we do lots of follow-up phone calls and we visit websites and we do all of that to, to try to get a really good sense of what's out there. Um, 
you know, we, we go to California Farm Link and NFU. Land for Good is a great resource. Uh, Land Stewardship Project, Renewing the Countryside, all do a lot of programming in this area. Um, and we reach out to folks working with underserved audiences like the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, their land assistance program, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, we, we, again, just really tap the people we know. It's, it's not a very big universe. And so um, by tapping the people we know and having them connect us to other people that they know, um, we, we found that we, we've gotten a pretty good sense of what's out there and, and then can, can work with both the people we're training, our advisors, and ultimately the, the beginners who get trained to get feedback on what actually works. Um, Cause it's really the end user who matters. You know, we can throw a whole lot of things at them but if they're complicated or if they <laughs> make them cry in the parking lot um, we might want to step back a little bit and say, you know what, what is the tool that's really, really gonna get them what they need to, to make their decisions and get onto land. Hope I wasn't too long. Poppy, it seems we're having audio issues. Morgan, we're ready for the next slide for Mike. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, and the uh, as I talked about before with how we used uh, the EHA in our own NFU Farm Business Toolbox, you can see that on our website there, nfu.org slash toolbox. And then a lot of the other tools that we've used uh, through the Beginning Farmer Institute or some of the other resources we've put out, you can find in the farmbiztrainer.wordpress.com. Uh, just a couple links there that I know that are useful to uh, our education department and to many of the people that have used our programs, and this is your way in. Uh, and by all means, feel free to dive in there, uh, critique it, let us know how it can be improved, and uh, also use it for your purposes too. But I do just quickly, not on the links, but I wanted to jump back to something that Julia mentioned a couple of questions ago. That's all right. Talking about how there is real no, there is no real uh, substitute for in-person trainings and building a cohort like that, and some of the value that comes out of having that togetherness. And obviously, this year has been a difficult uh, stretch to figure out how to do that and try to recreate it in a virtual world. I just want to say from a advocacy education side of things, from kind of the work that NFU does in putting together grassroots groups to figure out policy goals or to uh, do advocacy on Capitol Hill, we're kind of tearing some pages from the education model and the different programs and how there's it makes such a difference to build in more interactivity amongst the group rather than going and listening to policy experts rattle on for 45 minutes uh, at a time. Instead, to build in just at least the slightest bit of interaction makes uh, that first survey question, it does so much good. And then if you can build in uh, prompts and have some kind of homework to do before you come into the meetings, we're convening a group on climate, for instance, and they're going to get inundated with climate information. But if they have a chance to express themselves in ways other than just through the Zoom medium like this, uh, it can make st such a difference. So uh, I'll just stay on the advocacy side of things, have tools and the format uh, that they come in uh, helps a lot in other places beyond our education, also in policy education. That's a good point. Thanks for that. Carrie, you're up. Yeah, so basically everything that everybody's already mentioned, we also utilize as well. So we're based in Northern California. So we tend to look in our backyard first. So CAF is a really great resource for us. Um, Kitchen Table Advisors, 
And then we, of course, I'm not allowed to call Poppy a tool, but of course we always talk to Poppy and see what's really doable. And then I um, just really make sure to follow up with farmers and ranchers to see what the needs are. And if this even makes sense, like, would you attend this? You know, is this something that you really need? I think it's super important to always, of course, be talking to your farmers and ranchers to see what's really, what's viable and what really works for them. Thanks, Carrie. Um, Morgan, would you mind going back one slide for just a second? So I'll just say really quickly before we move on to the Q&A that the Farm Biz Trainer at WordPress is where I've put up the business health assessment, the business readiness assessment, and the succession and transition readiness assessment. They're all up there for download. Um, Spanish language version of the business health assessment is under review right now. So that'll go up there fairly soon. What else is up there is general wording around what these tools are and how to use them. And there's one document up there that cross references in detail the whole business health assessment, which is at least 100 questions. For each question, I have referenced links to where you might go for resources on that particular question, which is not a curriculum level, right? That's not curriculum level, that's actual how to answer each specific question. Um, thanks, Morgan. We're done with slides. And um, so now I'm going to look in the chat and start queuing up the audience questions. And while I do that, we're going to do a lightning round really quick. We're going to go Mike, Carrie, and Julia. If you would just answer um, what new tool you would most likely to most like to see developed. So I'm going to try to not answer that question exactly and just say one uh, potential improvement for the toolbox that we think would be uh, helpful and uh, you know, pick a topic add some more to it that would be great but I think uh, one thing I've heard from the education department at NFU is that it might be useful to know more about who's using uh, the or who's taking the business health assessment and not to know specifics about them necessarily more having or having some anonymized information about who's using the resource so that we can better focus development of additional resources within the toolbox would be especially useful. So I think uh, maybe that's skirting the question a little bit, but uh, the just having more background information about the users will help inform improvements. Carrie? Yeah, I think, you know, the feedback that I always get is that we need from farmers and ranchers is that they need more help with their books and being able to understand what they're looking at when they're opening their QuickBooks files or so forth. Um, I'm going to be doing a class or webinar with Julia Shanks this winter. And just like, so you hired a bookkeeper. Now, what do you need to know going forward? Because of course we hear this common, that's like, oh, I've got a bookkeeper. I don't really need to look at my books anymore. And it's like, no, you do need to be able to run reports and understand what those reports mean. So I'm excited to kind of see how that goes. And I'm sure that will be a test run. Um, there were also working on QuickBooks for folks that are not gonna hire, for the farmers and ranchers that are not gonna hire a bookkeeper, getting those intro QuickBooks videos and then also getting to you know, intermediate and advanced, I think is really important as well. Thanks, Carrie. Julia? Sure. Um, something we really want to develop actually is a farmland finder, um, but it would be focused on finding or identifying land that's been protected um, and that's available for sale or for lease. Um, we work a lot with the public and public programs and land trusts who have protected farmland. Um, the idea is to keep it available and in production in perpetuity. And so we really would like to find a way to connect um, new and beginning farmers to that land so that one, they have more access to land and also so that land continues to be farmed in the future. Great. Um, so there's not a lot of audience questions yet. So I'm gonna put out um, a plea for some more audience questions because this is your time and we were kind of going quick so we could leave maximum time for questions and discussions, I'll, um, while I'm waiting for some more questions to come in, 
um, I'll let you know that the tool I most need to see at this point and that I'm working on um, has to do with inventory accounting for people that have moved into value added production. And that's particularly niche meat producers. So in farming and ranching, we don't think about inventory because taxes don't make us think about inventory. But when you get into selling value added products, you live and die by inventory and inventory management. And so the fact that the IRS doesn't require you to manage inventory um, is a little bit of a <laughs> misleading concept, right? Because you still need to do it. It used to be the case that you had to do it because the IRS made you and then you later realized that you needed to do that anyway. Now the IRS doesn't make you, but you really need to do it anyway. So um, all the tools we had around niche meat, niche meat inventory were geared to the old tax law, which required inventory. And uh, with that swept, it just cleared the whole table. And so we really need to develop new tools that address uh, good strategies for inventory for niche meat producers. Um, so I have some questions coming in, and I'm not necessarily reading these in order, but I do want to answer one that it, um, someone had asked specifically about land acquisition, if there's a toolbox that assists with trust lands um, and fee patent lands for farmers in native communities. Um, I certainly want to um, refer you to the Indian land tenure um, resources. Those are the best resources out there on Indian land tenure. And Julia, did you do specific stuff in your curriculum on Indian land tenure? No, we did exactly what you suggested. Um, Indian Land Tenure is on our advisory committee and we would direct people to right. that. Um, it's a really important topic. It's also a really complicated topic. And so I would say um, we're at the beginning of the learning curve to, to try to understand it better and really rely on the people who, who know the subject well. Good, yeah, it's a very technical topic. Um, people have devoted their lives to the issue. So um, what is a top tool for reducing production risk and a top tool for reducing financial risk? Um, cost of production or cash flow analysis tool. So I want to put the production risk question aside because that's just not covered in, in this topic. Um, cost of production or cash flow analysis, two different tools. Um, Cost production, I wanna give a big shout out to new tools that have come out of Oregon TILF and Oregon State. They're outstanding. They're the best cost of production calculation tools I've seen uh, for row crops and especially crops. And they're working on new tools for livestock. Um, anyone else have a cost of production tool they like? And then on cash flow, we've mentioned the farm credit cash flow. And then I also have a cash flow tool that's a little bit different from the farm credit cash flow tool. Um, anyone else have cash flow tools? There's an interesting question here. It says, Julia kind of touched on this. But what is the panel's experience in saying no to their tools being shared? And um, what, how do you navigate that? Has anyone, well, I guess, Julia, you'd have an answer to that, right? <laughs> um, you know, our curriculum was developed with BFRDP money. So we feel like it is open access and available to anybody. We do ask for attribution, not only for ourselves or for our partners who may have developed some of the tools, but also for BFRDP for funding the curriculum. Um, obviously, if it's somebody's individual tool, they don't have to credit BFRDP, but if they're kind of looking at the whole thing. Um, but we, we do wanna have some some interaction. And so we kind of made the, with the people who are using it. So we've made the decision that things that are tools that are really beginning farmer facing, they're just up on our farmland information center and easy to use. And, and we hope in a, in a way that helps people progress through the process. But for using our curriculum, we ask people to get in touch with us and then we give them open access. But at least this way we know who's using it and we can work with them and 
help make sure that they're using it in a way that's effective and so on like that. But we right now do not say no to anybody. We just make it open access. Mike or Carrie, do you have any comment on that question? We, I mean, this actually makes, I've been focusing on our resilience program, but on our land access piece, we have, um, we really try to discourage folks from going under a website, under our resource list and just taking our draft template and trying to make a go of it with their land holder. And that, so it says draft all over it. It's really clear. Um, I've seen folks come back to me that have tried to do that. And it's literally that they cut and paste different clauses and things like that. So we really encourage folks to work with us directly. Um, we put our lease template on a Google doc. So everyone, it's very transparent. It's not like I'm you know, writing it all out for them. I'm having multiple conversations. And I think that's really important because it's been happening more frequently. I've been seeing folks like grabbing just certain language and it's like, but they're leaving out some really important clauses like termination, you know, because that's an awkward conversation that they don't really want to have or something like that. Right. Yeah. That's a really good point, Carrie. And it's, um, I, I want to pause here and really underline this. Um, it, professional, licensed professionals are always extremely nervous about giving up information into the public domain um, where it might be used out of context and therefore inappropriately, right? And so a lot of us as advocates for education, you know, self absolutely there, right? I, my whole life is about, I don't want to see financial information locked up behind certifi certified public accountants and not available to people that don't have that training or can't afford to pay for it. Same thing with legal analysis, right? People who work on leases at FarmLink, don't want people to have to go through a very high priced attorney to get that lease. But the flip side of all of that is the danger. Of, I mean, there's a reason that those professions require years of professional training and a difficult examination and professional licenses overseen by really, really no nonsense, grumpy people. Because a lot of harm can come from using the information without the full context. And I would say we just live in that place of challenge. We live in a little bit of a gray zone on that line, trying to free the information without doing harm. And that's part of the intent of the business health assessment is to put a lot of warning around that there's a lot more context than you were thinking. Um, and one of the things we've been working on related to this, Carrie, is um, information sharing around the right professionals. Do you want to talk a little bit about the shared Google Doc where people can share resources on bookkeepers, accountants, insurance, et cetera? Yeah, so we've had, you know, through Salesforce, I can run a report on our service providers and be able to give, um, you know, in, in my region, bookkeepers, CPAs, tax attorneys, and all of that. A lot of those folks I don't necessarily know. I mean, it's like I still talk to a lot of farmers and ranchers to get feedback on like, who are you using for your bookkeeper or, or who's doing your taxes and those kinds of things. So now we've taken this model that, of course, Poppy influenced on how we designed it um, for just to be working with other organizations and being super transparent. So it's like, why don't we put all the folks that we work with up and use, you know, kitchen table advisors can add to that list and also um, a new organization that's doing a web a platform called the Farmer Campus is also gonna have a part of that. And it's just tabs on a Google doc of bookkeepers, accountants, you know, uh, tax attorneys and those kinds of things so that folks can really go there. And we're not necessarily just saying like, no, this is the one person you should work with. Like here's a broad assortment of folks that you can choose from. That being said, I need, I have a ton of work to do on it because like for, I have a sh total shortage of bookkeepers. It's really difficult to find bookkeepers that want to work with these small diverse veg growers um, just because their numbers aren't in, as impressive or they don't understand it. And so that's like I, something I keep on like any person, I'm like, hey, have you ever thought about being a bookkeeper? <laughs> like, I'm having those conversations a lot more frequently. We have just a few more minutes before we close out this session. Um, last chance for 
questions to come up. There was one question about evaluation. Um, I'll answer just briefly on the topic of evaluation to say that um, all these tools are new enough that they haven't been out long enough to have really gone through formal evaluation, but they're all kind of coming up on that. So with the business health assessment um, in several different cohorts, I'm coming up at the first time that it's meaningful to have people who filled out the business health assessment two to three years ago completed. Again, it is not useful or meaningful to fill that out every year. That's too short a time increment. Um, so stay tuned. We're really looking forward to seeing what the deltas are after, you know, three years after doing these interventions. Um, I don't know, Julia, what plans you have for evaluation on the land access uh, curriculum. You know, through that longitudinal or over time analysis, it's hard and it's we're a nonprofit, so it's hard to fund within um, all of our projects, our first BF4DP and now the new one, we build evaluation in throughout. So when we deliver pilot trainings, we have both the trainers and the beginners evaluate. We use that to, you know, modify, adjust, revise what we've done, then we use it again. Um, but what we really haven't evaluated is if you go back and look at, you know, a first class of, of producers who are trained, how many of them now are actually on land with a secure tenure relationship. And we really, really want to do that um, because, you, you know, our goal is not just to do BFRDP projects. Our goal really is to secure this new generation and it's hard to get that feedback. And, and I feel like we need to get it after about five years, you know, sort of a lot of yeah. people will enter in a lease arrangement, then what happens? Do they get a longer term lease? Do they get a new lease? Do they have to move? Did they lose their lease? Did they do organic and make all this investment and then lose all that investment? Because, you know, I mean, we really need to find that out. And so, you know, we're moving out of the first project into a new one. I think when we finish the new one, we're going to figure out how we go back to that first project and start to see what happened with those begin that first group of beginners over the first few years. But funding Thank funding you. for that um, is an issue, you know, because it funding it's is not difficult. a sexy yeah. thing to fund. No. Thank you for that. Before I turn it back to Gary, I just want to say, to, uh, emphasize one thing, which is about the length of time on evaluation. And what I have learned over and over and over again is that it is totally common in my life to get an email from someone that starts, hi, I met you. And then the answer is two, three, even four years ago. And you offered to do follow up with me, any chance that offer still holds. And what is unpacked from there is it took them that long to be ready for the next step. And I just want to emphasize how normal that is. And so whatever we think about all of us collectively in terms of evaluation timelines, yes, our grant funding, et cetera, it squeezes us into annual evaluations. And there's some benefit to the short-term check-in. But the real assessment has to be over a much longer time period because that's the actual amount of time it takes people to, re especially beginning beginners, to really mature. It's, it's several years any way you cut it. And with that, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody, especially Farm Foundation and Gary for inviting us to do this panel. Hey, Poppy, thank you and Julia and Carrie and Mike for uh, a, a great panel. You guys are the experts with using tools and um, recommending tools. And I'm sure that there are gonna be a lot of people following the links that I saw pop up in the, uh, in the live chat. So thanks, thanks for all of your input on this. Um, tomorrow, uh, well, let me, let me say today, <clears throat> we've got uh, the networking session coming up. You have to leave this session, don't do it yet. You have to leave this session and go back to the event hub and click on that networking session. And that puts you into those tables where you can join uh, and talk with others. Um, I encourage our panelists to be there also. Uh, we had some trouble getting there last, after the last session, but uh, let's, let's try again, because we, we wanna talk to you uh, attendees directly, if we can. And uh, a little bit of advertisement for tomorrow's program. Um, we have 
two sessions tomorrow, so a little bit lighter day on a Friday. Uh, our session four is entrance strategy success stories. And what we've got are our pairs of presenters, a beginning farmer along with their lender is gonna tell the story of the processes and barriers and frustrations and, and successes that they eventually accomplished. Um, and with definitely a farm business focus. Uh, interesting thing based on what was talked about at, at this panel, um, one of the tools that will be demonstrated will be the one page annual cash flow budget tool that was mentioned several times in this panel. Um, and it's gonna use the direct experience of those beginning farmers uh, to add color and meaning to that cash flow budget spreadsheet training tool. So you're gonna hear the farmer story and then see it in financials. Session five, our last session for tomorrow, uh, of course, it's about su supporting generational transfers. Uh, the purpose of that panel is to provide very different perspectives on the farm succession planning, implementation, and uh, process, and uh, the impact on the farm and family farm businesses and the families themselves. Uh, the goal of the panel um, is to describe how to get beginning farmers and their families interested in the process, committed to carrying out and effective in implementation. So uh, all about <coughs> generational transfers for our last session tomorrow. And with that, um, we'll end this session unless Morgan wants to give us some directions about uh, getting into the networking site. Morgan, is there anything you need to say to us? No, other than just go on, head over. It'll be a good time. All right. Well, then see you all in the networking session and again tomorrow, 10 a.m. Central Time.